gone through trial and error, but I think we've gotten a really good process. Uh, so we learned that it's really, uh, it's prone to cold germination. So we put it outside in the hallway of the, of the warehouse and the warehouse uh, is cold and our grow room is really warm. So everything else germinates in the grow room and then we roll out our uh, red vein sorrel rack germination rack into the hallway and then it just does amazing. Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Emily Bloomington and Ray Sims from Farmbox Greens in Seattle, Washington. Farmbox Greens has successfully scaled a hydroponic microgreens business to produce hundreds of pounds per day while maintaining a small team of just seven. We touch on the best ways and lessons learned in building a microgreens farm team, an amazing trick to get excellent growth on red vein sorrel microgreens, the most thorough food safety implementation I've seen to date, and so much more. This is an amazing episode filled with tips and tricks to scale a microgreens business, and I'm excited for you guys to tune in, so let's get right into it. Hey, Emily and Ray, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's great to have you on. Um, I'd love to just start by hearing how both of you got interested in growing food and kind of the backstory of how you got involved with Farmbox Greens. Yeah, I can go first. So uh, right after college, I traveled Europe and I split my time woofing on different kinds of farms. Uh, I've always been passionate about food systems, sustainability, and nature. So when I got back from traveling, I tried to find a farm that I could work at year-round. And Farmbox was the perfect fit and checked all my boxes. So I started when I was, gosh, like 23. And now I'm 30. So <laughs> so it's been some time. Yeah. Uh, so that's very exciting. So I've kind of grown uh, throughout my time at Farmbox. Amazing. And, and Ray? Yeah, I, uh, I got interested in um, helping grow food and I wanted to be part of like solving food injustice. Um, I started in soil science in Indiana and um, sort of found a passion for sustainable farming um, and decided to move to Seattle to um, sort of pursue indoor farming um, and was really interested in uh, like soilless options and sort of the creative problem solving that you have to do to make it work um, without pesticides and without soil and um, just sort of all of the unique ways that the industry is um, answering questions um, that traditional farming never had to answer. So um, that brought me to Seattle and I found Farmbox um, and uh, sort of really started taking the hydroponic growing path because um, it's indoor and you don't need chemicals and it's... Um, that really speaks to me for sure. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And then, what 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 are your guys' uh, roles at at Farmbox, and like, what is your kind of day to day uh, look like in, in those roles? Yeah, so my role is operations manager, and uh, my day to day, it every day is different. You know, uh, <laughs> that's kind of the fun of it. Uh, but my major, like the majority of my uh, my tasks, my roles as, as operations manager is, uh, I manage personnel. I, uh, help with inventory, making sure that we have everything that we need to do what we need to do. Uh, I manage our payroll and, uh, I'm trying to think our foods, our food safety system. Uh, I'm in charge of that and plenty of other things. I just, it runs the gamut. Yeah, <laughs> wear a lot of hats. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Like operations, there's so much <laughs> involved in that, mm -hmm. um, especially as things like as a business grows and changes, there's so much that needs to uh, adapt to the changes in the business. And it's uh, definitely a, a, a big role uh, for sure. And yeah. uh, and Ray, what's, what's your role at Farmbox? Yeah, I'm the production manager. Um, I sort of also wear a lot of hats um, for a small farm that's Everyone wears a lot of hats, um, but I I manage the 
sort of preventive maintenance program um, for FarmBox. I try to keep the system running, um, the watering and uh, nutrient system, um, and I support the team with you know, any projects that they're working on, um, try to keep the, you know, the fans running, make sure that the, the lights get switched out, um, and then keep the ozone system running. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a daily thing. Um, yeah. Cool. So, uh, that, that's interesting. So ozone system, just out of curiosity, is that just to disinfect the, the air to keep everything like clean from pathogens? Is that the main purpose of it? Yeah. Ray should answer. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the ozone system is our kind of kill step for bacteria. Um, since we don't use any chemicals, the water is um, recycled through the system after it waters the plants. It's caught again and then turned into returned to the tank. And then the tank will run through the ozone contact system. So we have an ozone generator um, that makes ozone and then it gets uh, it gets injected into the water and then it will bind with the bacteria and sort of split it apart. Um, so it makes for a very oxygen rich environment, but it does um, sort of break up any of the bacteria that's living in the water. Um, but that's our only kill step for bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cause I know like, like UV is, is something that's commonly mm -hmm. used and there's like, you know, but ozone kind of gives a unique benefit in that it creates a high oxygen environment in the water at the same time <laughs> mm -hmm. as also killing bacteria and, and pathogens and fungus that's in the water. So that, that's, that's really cool. I've never actually heard of that being used, but that's a really smart way to disinfect. Um, keep in mind that most of my experience is with soil-based systems, not as much hydroponics. So that's kind of where my expert uh, expertise is. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, production, do you guys solely do microgreens or do you do other types of crops as well? Yeah, I can take this one. We, we do microgreens. So uh, we do micro herbs as well. Uh, but we, we grow for retail and food service customers, uh, and we grow a bunch of different kinds of microgreens. We grow micro broccoli. We have micro mix, which is our mustard blend. Uh, we have cilantro and basil, um, all different kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's so many varieties. How many varieties do you guys grow, uh, at any given time? Oh, that's a good question. I think we're growing like 12 or 13 different types of crops right and now when, yeah that, that's cool and then when, i was curious when you started was it a lot uh like like because you started pretty early on when the company started emily did mm -hmm. you uh was there a lot more crops you were growing back then or is it pretty steady state from that period of time yeah that's a good question we uh we actually used to grow more uh it, before the pandemic uh but because of the pandemic we had to kind of slim down and do what what were basically our best sellers and then after that, we've slowly integrated uh, seasonal holiday items here and there. Uh, but yeah, we used to grow kind of like smaller, uh, kind of like we had grew like celery and we had the individual types of radish versus radish mix, you know? So like we used to be a little bit more varied, but I think it, I think it's beneficial to us now because now we can just grow uh, and be really sustainable and like really consistent, you know? Yeah. With what we do. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, it's a trend I've kind of noticed is like my, my Koreans businesses that are still in the early growth stage will be growing or I shouldn't say growth stage, but like early, like, you know, first few years of growing the business. Everyone wants to grow everything because it's so exciting to grow mm -hmm. celery and shiso and uh, yep. and, and uh, all, like all these unique varieties, especially for, for restaurants, because that's where more of the demand for that is. Exactly. Uh, but as a uh, what I've seen is as a micro greens business matures, generally there's a smaller like skew and they just find like what works best and then mm -hmm. just doubles down on, on those products, which just sounds like what you guys have, have done, which creates a more efficient system, but mm -hmm. like there's less variety uh, of options, but like 13 is, is a lot. Like that's not like, you know, you think about a potato farm or uh, you know, a farm growing soybeans or corn, they grow one variety, right. in, like <laughs> thousands of acres, you know? Right. So it's still lots of variety. Um, and it's just, it's it, it that's what I've seen makes sense for in the long run for a, a lot of businesses to kind of narrow down the crops that they grow um, in terms of uh, production. Like, would, would you have a rough idea on what the split is between retail and like food service side, like percentage that, wise? Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, I think we're 70 percent food service sales, I believe. 
uh, thirty percent retail. Okay. Um, so majority of our sales comes from food service and chefs. Yeah, yeah. And um, so so Farmbox is owned by by Charlie's. Is Charlie's a distributor, and do they help? Like, is that is that where the integration kind of came in when they bought Farmbox? Is mm -hmm. like they help distribute the products to a further reach. Yeah, that's exactly it. So okay. uh, Charlie's uh, bought Farmbox, and then Farmbox is in charge of growing and packaging microgreens, and then Charlie's is, is involved with uh, sales and distribution. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's actually really nice because like you guys can focus on the growing side, and you don't need to worry about the logistics of oh, getting the so product nice. to customers. Yeah, that must have been a, a a huge benefit to have that like. I like they call it vertical integration where it's like one step further ahead so that you guys mm -hmm. can focus on what you're good at, which is growing the microgreens and they can focus what they're good at, which is distributing product. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We're farmers. Um, We're not salespeople. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's what I've noticed is it's like a very hard combination of skill sets to have uh, for these type of businesses in the sense of like, you know, you have to understand like logistics and, and uh, delivery routing and, uh, keeping the cold chain and like there's so many factors that you know are not necessarily directly related to farming so it mm -hmm. makes a much wider scope of skill set you need if you're like a one person running this kind of operation at a bigger right. scale uh, right. if you're doing it out of your home it's not too bad because it's just like pretty small scale but as you grow it um, having like a partnership like that is such a great way to focus on what you guys love which is definitely farming and not delivering yeah. uh, product and trucks sort of thing um, on the farm box green side, uh, how many employees, like, like what's the staffing situation like in terms of production? Um, and then as well on the production side, like what's, what's the output that you guys do in terms of trays or pounds or units, whatever you guys kind of measured in. Yeah, I can take the staffing question if Ray wants to take the production question. Um, so yeah, did you ask about staff? How many people yeah, like we have how, working here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we currently have seven people total at Farmbox. Uh, we've got an intern, a summer intern starting at the end of the month. Uh, so we'll have eight people. Uh, and so I like to say that we're small but mighty. Yeah. In every every kind of way, you know, we've got the the vertical farms, small but mighty, and so are we, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we got. We got a grow room lead. Uh, his name's Nova. And then Steph is our production lead and she's in charge of uh, running through harvest with the ta with the team. Uh, and then and then we've got our operations assistants and they help with day-to-day uh, -day operations. And so it's so then the team's wonderful and everybody is cross trained, you know, as best as yeah. we can, and everybody wants to learn and grow. So uh, it's a really, really lovely team, and I'm really excited about them and proud of them. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I think for um, production, I would say that. Um, so we hand harvest for the most part. Um, the intensity mix, that bestseller of ours, is our biggest chunk of the morning. That I would say. Um, between hand harvesting and we do have one machine harvester that specifically is only for that. Um, but the micromix by itself is usually 50 to 60 pounds a day, um, which translates to uh, roughly 200 packages um, of four ounce containers for food service. Um, but for our overall harvest, um, the days that we do retail packaging, I would say we're probably, oh, I don't know, close to 200 pounds of greens between mm -hmm. all of the varieties. Um, and then, you know, on, on just food service days, still probably 100, 150 pounds of greens a day. Um, wow. Yeah, I think, yeah, per week, it's it's over 1500 packages, um, mm -hmm. just from our little, our little farm. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's a couple hundred trays uh, every day. And then we break it all down and clean them and start over again the next day. Um, so it's, is it's, every day the same? Like, so you harvest five days or five or seven days a week? Yeah, we harvest five days a week. Uh, it usually takes our, our team about four hours, four and a half hours to harvest in the mornings. Um, we take a break there in the middle, but um, yeah, about four hours to harvest and then about four hours to do the cleanup and reset for the next day. Um, wow. So yeah. 
And then within that time, they're still like planting and checking mm -hmm. on things like like it, it's all done. So most days are pretty much the same, except maybe different things are planted. But like mm -hmm. the Monday to Friday is the same schedule for the most part on the production side. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay cool. Oh, wow. That, that's I, that's the first time I've actually uh, heard that. Usually farms like bulk uh, put it in, in a day or two. But I guess once you get to a certain scale, it might just make more sense to split it up. Uh, because mm -hmm. like I can imagine if you guys did that all in one day, it would be very, very difficult yeah. to manage. Yeah. Couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, It'd be way too much. Yeah, yeah. So what what kind of happens in situations? Because you guys it's 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 very interesting. You guys are in a very similar uh like production size, staffing size as uh Living Earth Farm, which is the farm that, that I used to own. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious on on like uh you know, when staff is staff are sick and stuff, like how do you figure out how to manage that because that that's a challenge that you know i think at a with a small team that you know one per, you're down one person uh it can make a big difference so how mm -hmm. do you guys kind of manage the the staffing situation with having a small team when someone is sick or away yeah yeah we've it's been a ever-evolving system uh and i think we've really figured it out but um i think the key is just is uh more coverage so We've hired more people <laughs> and that's really yeah. helped. Uh, so I think seven, I think eight is kind of our golden number, but a while there we were running like six people. Um, and that was very challenging to get all of operations done properly and on time. Um, so we've just uh, evolved and now have the capability to hire uh, eight people, which is really awesome so yeah. i think that and that way we have coverage for everything amazing okay so it's just it just comes down to like a pure like the math works out that when you have eight people the odds of more people being sick or on vacation than you guys mm -hmm. can handle so pretty much it sounds like seven is what you need uh to operate yeah. efficiently and then six gets more difficult but, but having eight the odds of two people being sick or away at the same time are low enough that it's not gonna yeah. happen too often yeah, it gives us flexibility, right? So uh, it's nice because then we also have the ability with seven or eight people to do uh, tasks that we are, no are not normally able to do on the day-to-day -day that need to be done. So like things that Ray's in charge of, like preventative maintenance, we can get that done at a reasonable time and yeah. it helps things uh, in the harvest room, right? So it helps the overall crop health improve. So it's it's really beneficial when we have all hands on board and everybody's here. <laughs> totally. Yeah, no, that 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 makes so much sense. Cause I've no I've noticed the same thing is like when you when you are, even if it's just slightly understaffed, all mm -hmm. the like all the things, the projects and and new things you want to try, like research and development, a lot of mm -hmm. stuff gets pushed aside to focus on the things that have to get done because they like the product needs to be sold, needs to be right. packaged. Uh, you need to disinfect what whatever to keep, yeah. keep the process going. <laughs> and then everything that is not urgent gets delayed. And I'm glad you guys were able to get a another person because just staying ahead of the curve mm -hmm. instead of behind just it, it makes it so much uh, more peaceful on a daily basis to yeah. uh, be operating the business. I'm sure you guys know exactly what I mean. Yeah, we uh, totally. Yeah, you're speaking our language. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm very glad to hear that because it's it's uh, you know one of those things that when you get to size, like people mm. may not realize that staffing becomes the biggest challenge of these type of businesses. Not necessarily mm. production. Like production is by you know year four or five starts getting much smoother. Uh, yeah. uh, if not like clockwork and then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, staffing and, and other related issues, um, you know, expansion become more of the, of the challenge. Uh, it sounds like the same, if, if correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like the same kind of situation on, on your guys end. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds really yeah. similar. Awesome. Um, so in terms of like pest and disease, um, is it so it sounds like ozone like is working wonders in keeping keeping uh disease at bay is that the only thing that you guys have to do like are you growing in trays and have to disinfect the trays is there any other mm -hmm. things that you do in the process of uh preventative disease and and uh, pest control yeah so um for our system we have uh, a lot of food safety guidelines because we produce ready to eat product uh, it doesn't need to be washed before you eat it because we don't use any mm -hmm. chemicals um, on the product. So Emily's in charge of our food safety program um, and it's backed up by Charlie's. We get an audit every year and um, 
essentially there's a lot of controls to make sure that we are being extra careful. Um, we sanitize, we scrub and sanitize the gutters on the grow system once a month. Um, the ozone helps to sort of maintain during, um, during the month. And then we also will, you know, spray and sanitize our water tanks, um, Mm -hmm. quarterly and, um, we have weekly cleaning tasks. Um, and then every day when we, uh, are done with harvest, the trays that we used are scrubbed and then sanitized before they're used again. So, um, we do a lot of sanitizing steps before we uh, get to the product part. And then by that time, the product can grow in a healthy environment and not need to be treated with anything else. Um, and then if there's any question marks on um, the product that we're getting ready to harvest, if it's like, oh, maybe this might have had something on it or like a piece dropped off the system or something, then we just toss <laughs> that entire thing in the compost um, just yeah. to, to be super safe. Um, we also do monthly water testing, um, and we do what weekly swabs on different surfaces mm-hmm. that are um, both food contact and not for food contact. Um, send them off to labs for testing. We also do daily testing for um, ATP, um, just to make sure that we did thoroughly clean things um, the night before. So we have to pass those swabs before we can start harvest, um, just to wow. make sure that we're mm-hmm. super safe, not getting yeah. too sick. So. Yeah, lots yeah, and lots and lots great. of controls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that, that it's great. It's great to have that because like all like the odds are very slim, but if you get an outbreak of something, like it can really damage one the reputation and and, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and like the safety people feel by buying your food. Um, yeah. So I'm glad you guys have like thorough protocols. And that might be honestly the most thorough I've actually heard in 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 the microns industry, like testing every day and not harvesting till the test is returned Mm -hmm. like negative that, that you're good Mm -hmm. to go. Like that's like pretty incredible uh, control in like, you know, the odds are that that, that's something that actually like really decreases the odds of having something because every day you're actually checking to make sure. So if something Mm -hmm. did come back, which I'm like, it's probably extremely rare, then like at least, you know, uh, nothing's going to get on the shelf where someone can consume it because you can just be like, okay, we need to figure out where this is coming from. And, and, create a plan and just stop selling the product for that period of time well before it even gets on the shelf with the Canada um, food inspection agency, they'll like take product from shelves and stores and take it back to the lab and test it. But by that point, people have already consumed it. So this mm-hmm. is like a much better system than relying on like what's in place with the local government authorities for food safety, because like it's so preventative that it almost like gets the odds to zero that someone mm-hmm. would get ever sick from the products that, that's amazing i'm, I'm really yeah glad that's our that. goal right yeah exactly to be as safe as we can yeah in, in terms of like oil media are you guys using like a soilless media or are you using like a like a rock wool type of where it's there's no like material at all that could be on the greens yeah we we grow on a really special material it's uh it's a pla uh compostable substrate oh interesting and it's made out of corn fiber and uh, it's made especially for us, which oh, is wow. very cool. Uh, and yeah, we, we cut it every single day. Uh, and we use, you know, we wear uh, hair nets and uh, gloves to cut it, you know, so that we're also very food safe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it comes in uh, a big batch. And so we, yeah, we cut it to size to fit our trays and then it's good to go. Then we can plant on it and it's fresh. Okay, so so it's 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 a, a a plastic material, but it's a compostable plastic that I guess has a lot of air space for mm-hmm. for the roots. And this, have you been? Is this what you've been using like since the beginning, sort of thing? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. So this is no. This work. is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> is uh, <laughs> we used to grow on a like a fleece. We would scrape it, and then we would run it through a washer, and wash it with laundry detergent. And then we would wash it again with bleach to sanitize it. And then they would be ready and good to go. And we would just do that every single day. And it was super labor intensive. Yeah, It was really fun. It was really, uh, I got really strong, you know, but, but it was (laughs) really, really labor intensive. Uh, and so Dan, our founder found the PLA substrate and uh, we've slowly integrated it. And then we started using it full time 
uh, when the pandemic hit. Uh, okay. And now we're just fully compostable. Okay, cool. And uh, have you like have you done any testing with like a uh, soil based comparison? I guess it probably wouldn't work in your system, but no. uh, I'm just curious like, yeah, to but... see if you've noticed any differences between the two. So you haven't you haven't tested? That. I haven't tested yeah. it. Yeah, it yeah. would. I'm. I know that we grow really really quickly compared to soil uh, because our system is running twenty four seven, three hundred sixty five days a year. So we are growing things as fast as they can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think that's a really unique part of our uh, growing operations is the lights are on 24 seven. We're watering things wow. 24 hours a day, you know, like yeah, yeah. they're not getting 24 hours of water, but like they're getting yeah, water yeah. pretty much every hour, you know? Yeah. So they're growing really, really quickly. Interesting. In my, I, I tried to do that early on, but I found uh, crops like basil, got really wonky without uh, a, a nighttime period. So even crops mm. like basil, you have 24 hour lights and you don't notice it. Wow. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It, right. it seems to work for microgreens, but if you were growing, were you growing regular size basil? It's, basil? It was so many years ago. I'm, I actually don't remember. It might've, you, maybe you're right. Maybe it was like, cause I, I used to grow full size basil. So okay. I wonder if that's why um, it, it was like when, when it gets to a larger size, it has that issue. Mm -hmm. Because that would make more sense just based on like the fact that, you know, a basil plant's a basil plant. So the genetics of the basil plant are going to determine if it can handle having no light for a period of time. Mm -hmm. well, growing right. it for like two weeks or something, uh, maybe it can just handle it in that early stage. Mm -hmm. so that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, that, that's cool. That you guys are doing it like 24 hours, but you don't have like a night shift or anything. It's just people no. during the day. Yeah, yeah. No night shift. Yeah. It just, the system just runs and then we come in at 630 in the morning and we're just... Good to go. go. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then the, the next production related question I have is like, given your guys size, I'm guessing you have like, it sounded like you have uh, some sort of harvester. I'd love to hear what kind of automation you have in place at the farm and like how that's kind of helped uh, with the scale that you're at. Um, we do have a harvester machine sort of looks like a little lawnmower on a conveyor belt. Um, and we use that just for the intensity mix. Um, Cause it's, it can do the work of, you know, two, three people within the same amount of time. Um, so we use that for just that. And then everything else is hand harvested because of cross contamination. You can only use intensity mix ingredients uh, in that space. So um, that does save us quite a bit of time. And then the other, really the only, only other automation is the grow system. Um, the lights are on 24 seven, the watering is automated. Um, so it is set up with a dosing system uh, we have set points that we expect it to keep with our um, EC and our pH, and then um, it just doses itself. And then there's sump pumps that suck it out of that bucket and then dose the clean water. So um, that nutrient dosed water is automated uh, with, uh, we use ratio um, uh, watering system to ba basically with Wi Fi keep track of what time it is and then water every hour. Uh, most everything is just like five minutes every hour, but we do extra water on our pea shoots. Um, yeah. They seem to really need it. So um, mm -hmm. other than that, everything gets treated the exact same. It gets the same light and the same um, nutrients. Um, so, you know, it works really well for some crops and some of them can't quite handle that as much, but it's sort of, uh, there's no way to specialize how many nutrients go to each yeah. thing. So um, it's definitely more of a, an average um, best case scenario for as many things as possible. Um, sure. The ozone system is also automated. It has its own set point and turns the generator on and off um, to keep trying to, to reach that set point. So that's all we keep track of the ratings, but we don't have to turn any of that on manually. Um, mm -hmm. And then the recycling of the system is also based with sump pumps. It co collects in a basin automates, um, turns it back into the dirty tank. So, um, all of that's pretty automated, but we do the rotation and watering all by hand. Um, so basically every tray gets looked at at least every other day by our eyes. Um, and we can really catch any problems as early as possible. And then yeah. especially with harvest, that's all um, done by hand with scissors, just regular old kitchen shears. So the quality control is, uh, I would say pretty impeccable for, for our product, I think, um, because mm. we, we specifically look at it individually. Um, even when it's running on the harvester, there's someone running every single tray, 
um, paying attention to the quality for each yeah. one. So, um, but yeah, it definitely makes things, um, I think as, as healthy and quick as possible for, for what we have. Yeah, for sure. So I guess really the only thing that like, like the, the, there's part of the harvest that's done by hand. And then I guess the, is the seeding done by hand as well? Mm-hmm. Okay. So those are the, yeah. really the only two parts of the operation that are like hands-on, like more manual. And then like the watering sounds like it's completely automated. The harvesting is partially. Um, and then like, you know, obviously you have to check to make sure there's no uh, disease spreading and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And then in terms of like dampening off seems to be the most common or pythium is the most common like pathogen. And it, mm-hmm. it, for, for some crops, I find it's much more prevalent and other crops like can just, you could throw pythium at it and it would still be totally fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you guys have a, a, like, like, you know, the ozone I'm sure must help a lot in, in reducing spread, but do, mm-hmm. I guess, do you have, is it common for you guys to have spots of pythium on trays? Yeah. 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 We, we joke that we have amaranth in our intensity mix and amaranth is so yeah. prone to pythium and we call it our problem child because we just we never know what we're gonna get that day and we're like yeah. all right it could be really good or it could be horrible and um and so we plant extra amaranth just yeah. in case we have uh a, a poor yield <laughs> and you, you grow the amaranths in separate trays or is it in like mm-hmm. it, okay so the intensity mix is not like i was thinking it's grown all in one tray and harvested but it's it's just a bunch of different items grown separately harvested with the uh, yeah mechanical exactly it's it's uh different components yeah got it got it okay that makes sense and what what like roughly is that like 50 percent of product like what what kind of like volume does that represent as total production oh i i'd say like a third okay yeah i think so i mean uh of our maybe 200 pounds that we harvest on a heavy day it's 50 to 60 pounds is just the intensity mix and its other components um, mm-hmm. I would say like 60% of it is run through the harvester machine, um, just cause it's like 50 trays. Um, and then the other parts are harvested by hand, especially amaranth for just as much quality control as possible. Um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah I found like we, we, uh, I've used the quick cut greens harvester. That's it, It's like a much less expensive tool than like, it's like the, what a lot of farms use. Um, hmm. And it, I find it cuts through everything. So, that, but but the issue is not um, that it, that the harvester won't work. Is there's, there's like a cross contamination concern with using hmm. the harvester with other products other than the intensity mix. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Um, okay. Cool. How does the like work work life balance kind of work uh, at the farm? Because you know, running a farm, it's you know, it's can be seven days a week, if not five days a week year round, mm-hmm. like you guys have a system that runs 24 seven. If crops don't get watered, uh, you know, if something fails in the system, like someone's got to take care of it. Cause otherwise all the crops are going to die. So like, mm-hmm. how, how do you guys find, uh, like if you can maintain like the healthy work-life balance, um, with you and the, and the other staff working there? Yeah. Okay. So I can go first then Rick can go. <laughs> uh, it's been a work in progress in terms of work-life balance. <laughs> I've had to really, uh, because work is really important to me, right? So I want to make sure that I'm doing my best. Um, but I have learned that uh, in order to kind of maintain a work-life balance, uh, I have to make sure that I'm putting myself first. And so uh, I've got a really solid routine that I follow at home. Uh, I cook with a weekly CSA box that I pick up uh, from a local farm. And I get outside and I walk the dog with my husband every day and I garden in my backyard. I grow hops and I grow oh, cool. flowers and fruits and veg. And then I swim uh, like three, four days a week. Uh, and so that just really helps my mental health. And then that way I can fully show up for everybody else. For sure. That's a great answer because I think a lot of people um, can can potentially come to uh, work with like all their, their, their personal stuff, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just something to be aware of. And it sounds Mm -hmm. like you've created the awareness that like, there's certain things you need to do to bring your best version of yourself for, for yourself and for everyone else at the farm. So that that's great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. It's important. (laughs) Yeah. I think, I mean, I would say Emily has set a really good example for how to leave it at the door and just 
this is microgreens. It's not rocket science. It doesn't need to be the most <laughs> stressful thing in life. Um, you know, we're not solving world hunger over here. We're just, we're doing our thing and it's pretty cool and it should be a pretty stress-free experience. So, um, we, uh, we sort of make sure to support each other's boundaries and remind each mm-hmm. other that we need to have boundaries with, um, our time, especially. Um, and, uh, I think the, really the only thing that kind of doesn't give us that choice is when the system does have, you know, a meltdown of some kind if a pump stops working and the system's <laughs> if overflowing onto the floor or, you know, mm-hmm. we've had a lot of those experiences lately, I think, because the system has yeah. been, is hitting that point where it's, you know, seven to 10 years old at this point. So we're starting to see things fail that were not expected to necessarily fail this quickly. Um, Mm -hmm. mostly because preventive maintenance wasn't really ever something that, uh, was fleshed out for, um, you know, guidelines. So, uh, what we are doing to try to, to support ourselves and our work-life balance is really trying to schedule and stay on top of preventive maintenance to prevent these, these meltdowns and the, and the, you know, any of the chaos that is mechanical that kind of keeps you here because the water has to happen. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so things like that, um, you know, we have alerts on our watering system that will tell us if it stops watering for some reason. Um, and you know, in those cases we'll come in and we'll make sure things get back on track and then we'll go home. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, we do have someone on a weekend shift, um, both days of the weekend, they are at least watering and planting crops. So we do have eyes on the system every day. Um, but those weekend shifts are shared amongst the team. So it's not Mm -hmm. always one specific person. Um, and everyone Mm -hmm. is sort of cross trained to know, like, is this an emergency? Do we actually need to call someone in to work on this or can we deal with it Monday? Um, Mm -hmm you know, that sort of thing. So we, we really try to cross train quite a bit to help each other and everyone else on the team, you know, feel confident that taking time off is absolutely deserved and should be taken. Um, cause you can't bring a hundred percent if you're spending a hundred percent at work, you know, mm. you can't, uh, do a hundred percent at work and then expect to still have a home life. You need to, you know, mm-hmm. still have something left for when you go home. So, um, I think from Emily's example, it really trickles down, um, very well for us to make sure that we have, um, we feel comfortable taking time for ourselves to make sure that we're bringing our best to work, but also knowing that you don't have to leave it all on the field when you're here. Um, yeah. Yeah. in fact, you shouldn't because it's really not that stressful. It should be fun being a farmer, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. so yeah, it's been a learning experience over the last couple of years for me, especially because I know it's a never ending project to keep the system running and clean and there's Mm. always something that can be done. Um, but Emily's Mm. doing very well at helping me just, we'll schedule it. We'll make sure there's time for it, but it's also important to, to have time to recharge. Um, Mm -hmm. it's, it's very active though. It's not easy. It's very active trying to remember to put yourself first because It genuinely is what's best for everybody if you are at your best. Um, For sure. Mm -hmm. I've been, that's a constant learning project for me. (laughs) Yeah, um, I I, I totally, totally understand that. Uh, that, That's great. Like, like I think like it's, you have the guys have the right mindset and and it sounds like you guys are working well together to create that environment that will succeed in the long run. Because like, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the biggest things I see is burnout in my careers. Like, you know, it's, I'm sure Mm -hmm. everyone that's done it for a long enough period of time experienced to some degree. Um, mm-hmm. it's just to minimize that as much as possible because it, it not only affects you, but affects like your, like, like you guys said, ability to show up and, and perform well for, for yourself and everyone else, especially when you're like managing people and dealing with, with, uh, like challenges that can come up, you know, what seemingly can be on a daily basis or weekly basis. Um, but that's great. Mm-hmm. And it's also great that you guys have like a system where not everyone has to work on the, like, there's not like a, a dedicated staff to work on the weekend. It's kind of mm-hmm. rotated. So I like how often, like, is it once a month sort of thing that someone has to come in or, or once every two or three weeks? Like, how does that kind of work for, for staffing on the weekend? Yeah, it depends on, I think it's like anywhere between one to three times a month for, uh, for a weekend shift yeah. and the weekend shifts are like four yeah. hours long. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, it's not an entire day 
you know, like it's, it's grow room activities, right? Yeah. So it's like, it's pretty fun. It's like, you know, you're there by yourself, you're blasting music, you're listening, you know, and you're just watering crops and rotating them and planting and then you leave. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty zen. <laughs> yeah, no, I, that, that, was, that was my favorite times at the farm is like when there's no one there and you can just mm -hmm. like play whatever <laughs> music you want and just like, you know, you're just there with the plants. It's like a very unique experience once, once like, obviously at the beginning, like, cause I started, uh, 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 living earth, like at the beginning, you're there all, all the time on your own, but once like mm -hmm. you have staff, it's like, it's, it's nice. Like it was such a great change to have other people around that are passionate about the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. but after a while, it's nice to like have once in a while a time on your own with the farm and just to be with the plants. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's like yeah, a special experience to, yeah, just be surrounded by so much life in such a small environment. Um, yeah. like just, exactly. the, the, if you just think about it, like there's like millions of seeds that are growing at a single time, I know. uh, and they're it's all so just cool. like growing around you. It, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's like when you, when you have that perspective, it really shifts like what mm. this is and what you're surrounded by and how cool it really is. Instead of like the mm -hmm. day to day of like, Hey, I got to fix this. I got to like work on this. It's like, I'm in this vertical farm with like millions <laughs> of plants around me. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great, yeah. I'm so glad that you get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. And then in terms of like, what, what is your guys personal, like out of all the microgreens you've grown or tried, what would you say is your personal favorite microgreen? And then like, how do you use them at home? Ooh. Uh, so mine's changed throughout the years, but I think right now my favorite's pea shoots. Uh, I like how sweet it is and how versatile it is so you could stir fry it you could put it in salads or wraps or sandwiches uh i love it it's so good it's like sweet and tastes like fresh peas and yeah yeah so good and you can just eat them on their own like a snack yeah they're so good yeah i think uh, mine has also changed i think when i started it was probably cilantro just because it's a tacos. I mean, it's so easy. Yeah. Um, I was making a lot of fresh falafel with a cilantro. You got to use way more when it's microgreens though, because oh. they're so small. But um, <laughs> I think probably the intensity mix lately is mostly the one that I take home. Um, it's just got so many different flavors and you can use it on soup and put it in salad, um, especially like a Caesar salad. The micro mix really goes well in there because it's mustard greens the red bean sorrel tastes really like lemony. Uh, mm. The amaranth adds like a really nice earthy flavor. There's red cabbage in there. Um, pak choy. It just adds such a depth of flavor to sandwiches and soups and salads. It's very versatile. I guess that's why it's the best seller, but chef seems to like it a lot. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing it's also very beautiful, like aesthetic wise, mm -hmm. just to like, you know, red bean sorrel and amaranth alone are some of the most like beautiful greens that, exist in the, in the world like that i've seen like <laughs> yeah it, especially red bean stroll it's like literally art it, it's like art in a plant it's it's really cool yeah um i agree but it is from like i i, I only grew it for a very short period of time um because it was such a slow growing crop uh, mm -hmm. production seems to be uh, a challenge with it for a lot of farms have you guys found any like tips or tricks especially like germinating it seems like is, is mm -hmm. a challenge like have you guys had those challenges and you found any solutions for, for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really funny. Yeah, we've gone through trial and error, but I think we've gotten a really good process. Uh, so we learned that it's really, uh, it's prone to cold germination. So we put it outside in the hallway of the, of the warehouse and the warehouse uh, is cold and our grow room is really warm. So everything else germinates in the grow room. And then we roll out our uh, red vein sorrel rack, germina germination rack into the hallway. And then it just does amazing. And, uh, and we are growing fantastic mm. RVS all the time. Interesting. So it, it was just a te temperature issue that, cause yeah, a lot of farms run really mm -hmm. hot. Um, do you know what temperature of the hallway is? Is it like 70 or under 70? Yeah, I think Ray, is it like 65? Yeah, in the winter it can get down to like 50, but normally even in the summer it's, mm -hmm. you know, 65 maybe. Um, so that mm -hmm. seems to be 
that seems to be doing it. We kept it out there even in the winter, uh, and it didn't mm -hmm. mind being in the 50s for germination. So it's been, I mean, last year, I think we had a lot of trouble in the summer with our RVS. It was just mm -hmm. not germinating at all. Um, and this year, we haven't had that problem at all. It's been very consistent. So it really does seem to be that cold germination that it really likes. Amazing. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's great to hear. I think that'll help a lot of farmers that are struggling with it. Like, I see this all the time. Um, and because I haven't grown it, like it's not something I could give advice to people on, but that's great that you guys have found, uh, like a solution. Cause I know, for example, like spinach, lettuce, like, uh, like if you're growing 80 Fahrenheit, lettuce is going to be a challenge to germinate as an example. Um, mm -hmm. and, and same thing with spinach, like it needs to be in the sixties, maybe low seventies. If it's much warmer mm -hmm. than that, it's going to really struggle. So, uh, it's good to know that red vein sorrel is similar and that like it needs its own environment that's cooler to germinate. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise it's, it's like, yeah, like that's the main, I don't think people have many growing issues with it. It's just like getting it to germinate seems to be the biggest challenge with it, which makes sense now logically after hearing the, the solution that you guys found. So that's, that's really great and great mm -hmm. advice for other farms as well. Yeah, it does pretty well with, um, it sits in the dark for seven days as well for germination. So it's mm -hmm. for a third of its lifespan is in the dark, slightly cold. Um, and that seems <laughs> to help. And then it just gets blasted with sunlight as soon as it gets in the room, but it seems to be, it handles chlor, it doesn't have any chlorosis. And then mm -hmm. the spectrum of lights that we use helps to bring out those red veins. So, um, mm -hmm. it seems to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so I guess it, it's, but most there, I know there's, I, I went to Boston microgreens last year and, and there were some crops apparently that like need light to germinate, but they start getting, this starts getting huh. into like finicky crops that are like super like uncommon. There's not a lot of growing information on them, but mo like I personally have never had any crops that need light to germinate. Most just mm -hmm. prefer being dark and, and cause like if it's dark, then there's generally going to be uh, more moisture holding capacity. Whereas like if mm -hmm. there's light hitting it. Uh, it's probably going to more likely dry out sooner, uh, which can be a challenge, especially for crops that take seven days to, to germinate like red veins. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, if you guys could just like wave a magic wand and solve uh, a problem you guys have in your role in at, at farm box greens or just in the business in general, uh, what specific issue would you want to be resolved and why? Yeah, we brainstormed on this one. And we came up with the fact that, uh, so like we said before, a unique attribute about our farm is that it runs 24 seven, 365. And so it can create special challenges, right? Uh, so if we had a magic wand to solve a problem on the farm, I think we'd pick minimizing maintenance on our watering system. Uh, right now it's super labor intensive to keep it operating all the time. And so if we could try to minimize our labor on that, that would be awesome. So we're currently troubleshooting ways to do that. And then hopefully that'll help things run smoother, uh, improve qu crop quality too. Um, so it'll do a lot of good stuff. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's it sort of translates to a similar issue um, where we have, because it's on 24 seven and it's a very oxygen rich environment after the ozone has done its job, we're running at like 300% oxygen rate sometimes. And that really pushes algae growth. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, we're constantly trying to clean and, you know, keep a clean system. Um, and it's, it's really just managing that algae because the water is on and it's full of nutrients and there's sunlight and lots of oxygen. The plants love it, but so does the algae. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of constant in that way. Um, but it does seem to be, yeah, that's kind of our biggest um, time frame. And that's also why staffing is super important. So we can stay on top of those things and then just kind of help ourselves out in the future. But, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes total sense. It, it's something that like, you know, uh, there, there's in every system, there's different challenges. So like outdoor farming, you got to deal with the weather. And the weather is like completely unpredictable in most places, unless you're in like Southern California. And even still, sometimes you have no idea the, what the weather is going to mm -hmm. be. Um, and then like with, uh, you know, an indoor farm that's using soil, you have to ensure the consistency of the soil um, it, mm -hmm. is something that can be a challenge. And then if you're going hydroponically, it can be like the, if, the, if a pump breaks, 
like it's like <laughs> doomsday like it's it, it's you know like you rely on those pumps uh and, yeah. and that to create the system otherwise you know the plants are so reliant on the electricity that without it yes. uh or without those pumps you know it, it, it's it, it can be a, a pretty big failure so like every system <laughs> has its pros and cons and, it, and it's it's good to have the reality of what you know there's lots of benefits but there's also uh, challenges with different types of systems. So it's great to hear uh, both sides of it to get a realistic, uh, uh, you know, idea to what, you know, the challenge with potentially going hydroponic versus soil could be and vice versa with like, you know, for example, during the pandemic, it was really hard to find soil because like, mm. you know, there was supply issues and prices went up like crazy and it's a big input cost. Um, so, you know, different challenges, different environments, but, um, this has been a great episode. I think there's lots of value here for farms that are just starting out or farms that are scaling up mm -hmm. and hearing uh, uh, the solutions you guys have found and the challenges that you've had uh, along the way. And um, yeah, so thanks so much for, for coming on. Um, if people want to connect with uh, you guys or Farmbox Greens, where can they find um, you guys on social media? Yeah, thank you, Jonah. Uh, so we've got a website. Uh, it's farmboxgreens.com. And we've got all of our information on there. And then if they want to connect on social media, we have our Instagram at Farmbox Greens. Awesome. All right. So, yeah, I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. If anyone wants to connect with uh, Emily or Ray, feel free to do so. Uh, they, they're a wealth of knowledge. So, um, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Jonah. Thanks for tuning in to the Mike Green's Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Mike Green's business, visit MikeGreensConsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Mike Green's businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Mike Greens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Mike Greens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.